Hi guys, um, thank you for coming this evening. So uh, I'm going to start uh, by giving a talk called How to Succeed in North Phoenix. I'm not sure I'm fully qualified to give this talk, but that's what Miss Ward put me down for, so that's what I'm doing. Um, my name's Robert Payne, I'm a CT2 working in TNO at the moment at UHCW. Um, and so what we'll go through is why you might consider orthopaedics. I'm guessing you guys are all thinking about a surgical career, but perhaps some of you are sort of similar to I was at this stage and not really sure which area of surgery would be uh, sort of best to go into. Um, so why orthopaedics is interesting, what the training pathway looks like, what I've done, and then what I've learned along the way, and then a lot of time for any questions at the end. So feel free, but if anyone wants to ask anything along the way, just do it. So I've put up some nice gory pictures because that's normally what's interesting. So um, orthopedics covers everything from, obviously there's the trauma side, which we see far more of at this stage of our training. So as an SHO, if you do decide to get into orthopedics, you'll deal with a lot of trauma. We see the occasional elective patient, but not really very much of that. That sort of comes along as you get into your registrar training. Um, and it's everything, so you could specialize in something like trauma in itself, or you could be a spine surgeon, a hand surgeon, uh, Mr. Jones is going to come along and talk to you a bit about hands a bit later, uh, arthroplasty, so it really is uh, quite a wide scoping area. And for me, it's about my interest in, so I always enjoyed maths, physics, engineering, mechanics, that kind of thing, and it's a com combination of that with surgery and medicine that makes it interesting. But um, I think it's a great career, I think there's something in it for pretty much everybody. Um, so I'm from Leamington originally. I uh, Tried three times to get into university and eventually got into a medical school and went to Brighton, Sussex. Um, and then came back home to Leamington and did my foundation training at Coventry and Warwickshire. Whilst I was in my foundation, I did my Part A. And then, uh, as you can see, I sort of took an extra couple of years in there and did my Part B in one of those years out. Um, and we do get spare time. So in my spare time, I sort of spend it with friends, family. I try and go to the gym when I can. I watch rugby, I did used to play, but not anymore. Uh, and I like DIY and cars, which is... So the training pathway, so most people will finish medical school, they'll do their F1, F2, move on, apply an F2 and do a CT job in uh, probably an orthopaedic themed uh, CT. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but all core surgical training now pretty much is themed. So uh, that means that you'll get at least eight to 12 months of that specialty during that time. Um, and then during your CT2 year, apply for ST3. Um, so things to sort of consider or questions that come up along the way are whether or not you do your surgical training in a DGH or a university hospital. I think early on in your career, some, a DGH is quite a good option because it normally means that you get to go to theatre a bit more. So my F1 was at George Elliot, which although it has its faults, is a great place to do general surgery because you actually get to go to theatre as an F1 and operate. If you're interested in that, it's brilliant. So I was doing hernia repairs as an F1, and my colleagues at UHCW were doing cardexes and writing up fluids. And it's a bit different in a teaching hostel where you've got trainees that need to go to it. So um, that is something to think about. Having said that, at a university hospital, you'll get more consultants who are interested in teaching. Um, you probably see best practice. Um, and so just sort of keep that in mind. Um, does it matter whether or not you do ortho in your F1, F2? Absolutely not. So even if you're absolutely 100% you want to do orthopedics now, it doesn't matter whether it comes into your F1, F2. What I would say is if you haven't got an orthopedic placement, try and get, do a taster in it, or at least go and speak to someone in the department and get involved in an audit or a research project, or do something, or go to their theatre sessions that just show an interest. There's regular teaching for um, orthopedics who show and ask if you can go along to some of that. There's, there's always a way to get involved at an early stage, even if you haven't got a rotation in it. But it's really not important. An F1, F2 rotation in orthopedics isn't going to be the same as training. It doesn't really matter. And then where in the country to train. So um, again, I think this is just down to sort of personal choices and whether or some deaneries are much bigger than others, so for some people it's nice to pick somewhere that's a little bit smaller that they can settle in and then they don't have to move around. Um, other people are happy to travel all over the place and don't mind that. Um, and then when you should decide on a specialty, I would 
although I'd encourage you all to do orthopedics, I think it's good to keep an open mind. And I think that your training will be better if you do that, because you'll apply yourself to everything that you do. You'll get the most from every job. So I did an awful lot of general surgery along my way, and I really enjoyed general surgery. Um, and I've learned a lot from that that I can then take into orthopedics. And this, similarly with jobs, like I did a pediatric F1 job. Now, that doesn't seem related in any way, but when you go and see kids on as an orthopedic SHA, that's really useful because you're happy taking bloods, you're happy talking to a child, you're happy examining them. Um, so I think try and keep it as, as late as possible, which is probably sort of you should be by the end of F2, you should be starting to think about it, but try and keep it late. Um, so my route is slightly different to the standard training. I did F1, F2, um, I did the general surgical <coughs> job in that, and I did TNA. I also did A and E, and I think that's something that I also tell everybody that they should try and do. So try and do it as an F2 if you can. As an F1, it's a bit limited, but as an F2, you can um, really get involved. You also see things that, as an uh, orthopedic SHO, we don't deal with very much. You don't pull many risks as an orthopod because A and E have already done it, and they've put them in the back side, and they've sent them to fracture clinic, and you don't see it. You don't reduce that many shoulders because A and E can do it for you. They've got EMPs now that do it for you. So if you get to do an A&E job, then you can get involved in all those minor injuries. And when you're called as the SHO to go and sort out the difficult one, you've at least done it a few times before that. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to have orthopedics. I have to say, in my orthopedic job as an F2, I think I went to theatre about twice. So it's definitely not that important. Um, I then took an F3 year, so that was an intentional year out. So when I did my F2, I didn't apply for any surgical training. I knew that I wanted to go travelling, I knew that I wanted to make them, and I thought if I got offered a surgical training job, I would find it very difficult to turn that down and decide to go. So I took a year out, I worked for six months as a medical SHO, as a locum on the medical outliers team, which is vaguely medicine. And, uh, it was great. It was nine to five every day. It was Monday to Friday, and I had quite a lot of money doing it. And I got six months travelling, which was brilliant. Um, unfortunately, so I applied in that year to do core surgical training, and I didn't get a post. And I think I didn't focus enough on the interview and treat it like an exam. So at any point that you have an interview for anything, treat it and revise for it the same as you would for an exam. Um, I thought it would be quite straightforward. I thought I've already done quite a few jobs. I've done A&E, I've done an extra year of medicine. I felt I was probably a bit more experienced and that was to my detriment. Um, and so I did an F4 year, which I likened again, but this time in general surgery. Um, and I did my part B during that year. And like, so I basically would say if, you, if you're inclined to take time out, I think it's quite a good option. You're not really penalised for it until you come to um, apply for ST3. It's, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but yeah, if you want to take time out, do it. Um, and then I went on to CT1 and CT2. My job was orthopedic themed, um, but I did a bit of plastics and a bit of ITU in there. And I'm currently applying for, or have submitted an application for ST3. So this is just to show you why I decided to take an F3 and an F4. So you can go traveling, you can do your exams, you can just enjoy earning a bit of money and having a life for a little while. Um, so something I'd recommend. And as I said, keep your options open. Every job you go to, if you want to be a good orthopedic trainee, then um, I think that you need to be committed to the training. So make the most of every job you do. Get involved in audits, in presentations, in research along the way. It doesn't matter whether or not it's related to surgery or orthopedic. They still count on your application to SD3, even if it was psychiatry presentation. It really doesn't matter. It's just get involved in stuff. Um, you can take time out, you will be penalised, you will lose points when you apply for SD3, but if you've done stuff in that time that compensates for it, that's not such an issue. So if you've managed to publish something from that year out, then you've gained some points and lost some points. So overall, it doesn't really matter. Um, take every opportunity that comes, whatever that might be, and try and get your exams out of the way early. So certainly your Part A is very similar to what you guys will be studying for in your finals. And doing it early, it's all fresh in your mind, I think, in F1, get your, get your Part A out of the way. Your Part B, 
I think you should probably wait. Some people do do it early, some people do it in F2. But personally, I think you get a bit more experience on the job. It's more about the sort of practical application of the knowledge and do a few surgical jobs before you probably have done a general surgical job first. Um, and it's quite expensive, so you don't want to do it too many times. And then always look at your next person spec along the way. So you guys are going to be applying for foundation training. Look at what they give you marks for. Look at what they, um, what's important, what's not. For example, so we're applying for this. Or I'm applying for ST3 at the moment, and uh, only closely for audits can. If I thought about that earlier, I would have made sure that I closed every single audit I did. Um, and every piece of work that you do, try and get as much from it. Just be efficient with your time. So if you're doing a project, try and submit it somewhere. There will probably be a conference that will take it as opposed to a presentation. Submit it for a publication if you can and see what happens. There's nothing to lose. And just the process of doing it is, is sort of educational, worthwhile. Um, be efficient with your time, work hard, enjoy your training. Um, has anyone got any questions? or? Um, so that's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, so I think it's it's right. People worry about work life balance in surgery, um, and they think that you've got to spend all your time working. Um, you do have to work hard, and I think that you probably do have to commit a little bit more of your time. Lists run quite late in the day, and if you're interested in it, and the case that you might <coughs> be able to do something, or that you're going to learn something from, is happening at seven o'clock, you want to hang around and do it. Um, but you can still have a life outside of work. You just need to you just work hard. Yeah. Uh, isn't that kind of like CT1 jobs? Mm. Is there a, a requirement for like a number of publications that you need, or there's no? Um, so you, you score for them, yeah. you, and you, and you'll always score for any publications that you've got. They look at so tend to look at things like presentations, publications, posters. Uh, whether or not you've got your exams and the courses that you've been on, uh, and then any evidence of management and leadership and teaching are the sort of core areas that they look at for most of sort of along the way. Um, there is no minimum number, and some people will make up for, some people will have 100 publications, but they haven't got much experience in another area, and others will make up for it in their teaching or leadership where they might have done a formal qualification in teaching or something like that. So everyone's a little bit different. Some people do spend more time publishing, and, um, but at CT1, no, it's certainly not a, a requirement, and you can definitely. A, a lot of people applying at ST3 haven't got a publication, so you can certainly do a core trading job. <coughs> published. But if you can get something, that's great. Yeah, in terms of publications, are they graded at all on like the quality or the relevancy to the post you're applying to? Can it be anything? So relevance to the post, no. Um, in that uh, normally it needs to be published in a PubMed index journal. That's the sort of basic requirement. Impact factor isn't considered. S subject area that it's in isn't. So my publication, I've two, one was in cardiothoracics, one's in general surgery. Nothing related to orthopedics. The only thing I'd say is that as you get further along the line, you probably are working more in that area, and so you'll tend towards that. And also it demonstrates commitment to specialty, so it's probably scoring you in another area. But if you're working with someone who's doing something, can then get involved with it. And do it. Any more questions? Thank you.